are so thankful that you're joining us tonight as we all gather to celebrate the joy that is Christmas and the Lord's coming. And as we go into these songs, I pray that you sing along with us and you just really, truly feel the great um, wonder that is this holiday season and getting to be able to rejoice in Jesus' coming.
2, 1 through 7. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Oh, oh. 
2, 8 through 14. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of the heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Fifteen through twenty. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. 
After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Matthew 2, 1 through 11. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law, and he asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come to you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It was ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests, and they gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Thanks for joining us tonight. Merry Christmas. You know, I, I want to take a moment tonight and look through the Christmas story. And as we do, there's going to be one word that appears more than any other word. In fact, in the Christmas story, this word that we're going to talk about appears eight times. And it's the word joy. Now, to understand joy, we have to recognize that there's a difference between happiness and joy. So first off, happiness is based on happenings. Happiness is temporary. It comes and goes because it's dependent upon external factors at work in our life. And, and we understand that, don't we? Now, joy, on the other hand, is a choice. Scripture says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so when we choose joy, it actually brings an internal strength to our life. In Isaiah chapter 9, we've been looking at the names of Jesus. And in verse number 6, here's what the prophet Isaiah said. He said, For a child is born to us, 
A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And here are the names of Jesus again. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, I bring up that word peace because somebody said this. They said that God's peace is actually joy resting and that his joy is peace dancing. And so what that says to you and me is this. No matter what we go through in life, God wants us to be joyful and he wants us to choose joy. In fact, that, in fact, God wants us to keep dancing even when we don't like the music. You know, we all face different things in our life. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. And no matter what we face in life, God wants us to keep dancing. Now, here's what we recognize, though. That's easier said than done, isn't it? Because we struggle to maintain our joy. In fact, we stop dancing a lot of times because we don't like the music. And so there are enemies of joy. There are external forces out there that are trying to drain us of our joy. And I, wanna, I want us to focus on that tonight in the characters of Christmas. So I want to look tonight at Mary and Joseph and the wise men and some of these factors that tried to drain their joy. But then more importantly, how were they able to maintain their joy? How were they not able to give in to their feelings and come out on the other side victorious and excited about what God was going to do? So here's the first thing. We have to understand the enemies of joy. So the first enemy of joy is worry. And we see this with Mary in her situation, don't we? When the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that God had chosen her to give birth to the Savior of the world, she wasn't excited. She wasn't happy. In fact, in that moment, she wasn't joyful. She was anxious. I think I would be too. She was worried. In fact, Scripture says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 29. It says this about Mary, that she was confused and disturbed and that she tried to think what the angel had told her. She, she's confused. She doesn't understand the significance of the news that's being brought to her by the angel. And then her emotions even take her further because in verse 34, it says, Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. What you're saying to me is biologically impossible. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And so Mary was anxious. She was worried. She was nervous. She was upset. She was afraid. And you and I just need to remember this. Worry will drain our joy. When we're worried, it's hard to dance. And we see that with Mary in her situation. But now let's look to Joseph for a moment. The second enemy of joy is heartache and pain. You know, poor, poor old Joe, right? He kind of gets overlooked in the story, but, you know, he's planning to marry Mary, and he's excited about their future together, and he's making plans and preparations for them to, to, to be wed and to have a family and a life together. And then in a very moment, his hopes and his dreams and his plans and, and everything that, that he was just looking forward to, it came crashing down around him when Mary says to him that she's pregnant. And oh, by the way, you're not the father. You see, in that moment, Joseph was betrayed. In that moment, he was heartbroken and devastated. And what I want us to think about is this, you know, when life doesn't go our way, when the plans we make fail, when the people we love disappoint us, when our dreams appear to fall apart, let's call it what it is. It hurts. And we've all experienced heartache and pain in this life. But when life hurts, here's what tends to happen to us. We, we become cynical. We become critical of others. We become judgmental. We become bitter. Oftentimes, we'll hold on to a grudge. We'll We'll become angry and resentful. And, and let's just say this. We can choose to live life that way. But understand, if, if we live with this heartache and pain, it will drain us of our joy. When we're heartbroken, it's hard to dance. And then when we come to the wise men, we see the third enemy of joy, and it's confusion. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says this, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, Judea during the reign of King Herod. 
About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. Now, we have to understand that the wise men didn't just miraculously show up at the house where Jesus was. Okay, They traveled, scholars estimate, anywhere from 400 to 700 miles. And so if we put this into perspective... If they rode by camel, a 400-mile journey would have taken them about two to three weeks. If they walked, it would be 30 days or longer. And if they had followed the star only at night, the journey would have lasted even longer. And so you can imagine when the wise men show up at King Herod's palace expecting to find this newborn king and he's not there, you can imagine they, they arrive there tired and exhausted and weary from their travel. I mean, think about it. They expended a lot of time and effort and energy and even finances into finding Jesus and into pursuing Jesus. And so when they show up and Jesus isn't there, they're a little bit stunned. They're a little bit confused and they're not quite sure what to do next. And I know that we've all faced confusion in life. There, there are factors that come into play, things that happen to us that we're not sure how to make it through. We're not sure what to do next. And I, and I just want to remind you of this. Confusion, though, it will rob you of your joy. When we're confused, it's hard to dance. And so here's the question that I really want us to look at tonight. This, this Christmas Eve, here's the question. How do we keep dancing when we don't like the music? When, when we look at Mary and Joseph and the wise men, how were they able to maintain their joy? Now, here's the answer. Up front, it's simple, but, but I want us to focus on this a little bit more. The simple answer is this. How do you maintain your joy? It's this. When, you, when your focus changes, your feelings change. Let me say that one more time. We, we got to get this. When your focus changes, your feelings change. And so everything changed for Mary when she focused on God's plan. I mean, in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, 38, we've already read how Mary was worried and anxious and just nervous about the news that Gabriel gave to her. But in verse number 38, here's what she says. Mary responded. This, this is a a declaration of faith. This, this is incredible. She says, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So understand this. Mary wasn't trying to figure out God's plan. All she was doing is this. God, I trust you and I accept your plan. So, so let me say to you this way. Mary overcame worry by trusting God and accepting his plan. And you see this again, that Mary begins to focus on God's promises. When she did that, she went from confusion to celebration. She went from worry to worship. Because in Luke chapter 1, verse 48, she says, For God took notice of this lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. How do we maintain our joy? We have to trust God and accept his plan. And then... Think about Joseph. Everything changed for Joseph when he focused on giving God his pain. This is so important. Life hurts sometimes. People let us down. Disappointing things happen, right? People come, people go. Life hurts. It's painful. And Joseph is in this, this state of, of pain right now because he heard that his, his soon-to-be wife is pregnant. And he's just discouraged and heartbroken. But understand this, Joseph overcame his heartache and pain by doing two things. He extended grace and he laid down his pain. We know that he was planning to divorce Mary. He, he, he was so devastated that he was like, I, I, can't have a, I can't see a future with Mary any longer. But here's what he did. He extended grace. He didn't try to, his, his desire wasn't to destroy Mary. His desire wasn't to try to get even with her. He said in his heart, I'm going to extend Mary grace. I'm going to give her what she doesn't deserve. But then he did something else. He, he said, God, 
here's my pain. I'm going to give it to you. I, I can't hold on to this. I can't carry this because it's robbing me of my joy. And you see this in Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 20. It says, as Joseph considered this, talking about divorcing Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then in verse 24, it says, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. I, I think that's, that, that's a, a great lesson for you and me. When we are heartbroken, when our plans and everything seem to fail, what we need to do is extend grace to people that have hurt us and wronged us. But we also need to give God our pain. Because if we hold on to that pain, it will drain us of our joy. And then everything changed for the wise men when they focused on the next step. If we go back to Matthew chapter 2, verse 9, it says, After this interview, so after the wise men met with King Herod in his palace and talked about this newborn king, and if you remember, Herod said, Well, if there's a king, you go and find him and then come back and tell me, and we'll go and worship him. But we know that Herod's plan was to ultimately try to kill this newborn king. So after this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem and went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country another way, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So again, the wise men are confused. They show up at Herod's palace expecting to find a king. He's not there. They, they hear this crazy man talking to him because King Herod was crazy. You can look through the pages of scripture and history and see that. And so they're not sure what to do. And they find Jesus. They worship him. And then God gives them direction. And here's how you overcome confusion. The wise men overcame confusion by following God's light one step at a time. You see, oftentimes God doesn't give us the big picture. There are times that he will, but sometimes it's just the next step. Did you know the scripture says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord? And so how do we overcome these, these factors, these enemies of joy? Well, again, trust God and accept his plan. Then you extend grace and lay down your pain. And then as the wise men did, you just follow Jesus one step at a time. Because here's what's amazing. When we seek Jesus, here's what he says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Would you just open your hearts tonight to the joy of the Lord? You see, joy isn't found in, in this world necessarily. Joy is found in Jesus. And when we seek him, when we give him our pain and our worry and our confusion, you know what he does? He takes those burdens and he gives us his peace. He helps us to rest and he gives us this internal strength to continue to follow him one step at a time. So I hope you know that we love you. We're praying for you. We hope that you just have a wonderful Christmas However you spend it and are able to spend it, we, we hope that you just sense God's peace and his presence and that no matter what you go through in the days ahead, that you will choose joy. We love you. The best is yet to come.
The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not...